feedback I've gotten over the years from attendees is that while the material is powerful and it impacts their businesses, they just don't get enough. So they say to me, if only we could spend more time with you and the other presenters and really pick your brain, absorb the knowledge that you have to share and get hands-on training. So to satisfy this need, I created Success GPS programs. If you're here, it's because you want to succeed. Being the fact that it's a hands-on workshop, we are getting a ton of value in terms of gaining more clarity for our business and approach, uh, approaching ways to wow the clients and customers that we do have. Some of the Success GPS events are short, single-day experiences, a couple of hours, but our premier event is an extended, hands-on, experiential retreat. Business owners can come, spend three full days locked down and learning everything they need to know to be successful in business and in life. Everybody up, I'll come out and get you. You over there too, up, up, up. See, if you already sit down, then you've already flunked, which means you've already given up. Industry leaders that are here today that are so authentic and passionate about being of service to others, uh, it, it sort of opens my heart and my mind to being really possible and staying on the right track. I've spent 25 years listening to thousands of speakers looking for the best of the best. Of all these, I handpicked this lineup of amazing speakers because I knew that they would bring it and that they would put it all on the line with their heart and soul to create an amazing experience for our attendees. In addition, all of the presenters are passionate about helping small businesses and entrepreneurs succeed and take the time on and off the stage for every attendee to get what they need to go to that next level. So, so I say show up, follow up, and lift up. Give back and don't ever, I don't care where you are in life, if you think you haven't arrived somewhere to where you can't give something back, you're wrong. It's the exact opposite. The minute you start stepping, bring someone with you. Don't even hesitate, get here, do it. Be here, be the first one signed up, be, sit in the front row, get all the information and you, it will be mind-blowing. It'll just be, it's a game changer to be here. It's just a game changer. Wow. So don't miss the experience live and in person. Go to register at successgpsseminars.com for our upcoming event. And in the meantime, get ready to be inspired. How are we doing? All right, ready to get started? All right, so let's see, show of hands. How many of you think you're innovators? Wow, look at that. Reno rocks, that's like 50%. Uh, so how many of you on any given day, week, month, uh, use a product or a service and you say, God, that could be done better? Imagine if it was like this and you start iterating and thinking about it. Anyone? Okay, 100%. So the only difference between being an innovator and someone with an idea, if you have an idea and you do something with it, you tell someone else, you engage with them and you get them to, do, to work with you on it and maybe even form you know, a, a business around it, you know, then you're an innovator. So you just have to take those ideas and do something with it. So all of you have those ideas. And you know, when we think about starting businesses or um, you know, doing something to disrupt what's out there today, it's one of two things. It's either um, it's never been done before, and we've seen many examples. We've got Uber and Airbnb and all kinds of businesses, Facebook, that just were the first to get out and do something. Uh, but the majority are ones where something's out there and you're just finding a better way, better way to do it. And so then it's execution, right? So um, the, uh, the talk that I wanted to start, to start with here is um, these sort of, I call them pillars for achieving small business or startup success. Uh, this is really born out of, you know, when, uh, so, so I'll tell you where Constant Contact is today and I'm gonna go back, you know, kind of the, to the beginning. Um, so Constant Contact has 650,000 customers, uh, 1,500 employees. We had 8,000 sort of channel partners. Um, we went public about uh, in 19, or sorry, 2007. And then a year ago, we sold for 1.1 billion. All right. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I tell that because you know, there, was, there was a long journey. There were a lot of amazing people that came in to help in executing that, that, that sort of original sort of vision and idea. Um, but let, let's think about when we started. You know, there are three of us in an attic, right? So three people, two techies and me, and we were set, setting out to do something. And so I'm going to take you through sort of the, these pillars wrap around some of the things. What did we do when we were sort of scrappy 
in those early days, you know, when we had, <clears throat> we didn't have any, um, you know, people, you know, team, we didn't have any resources, we didn't have any money, we didn't have a product, we had a PowerPoint, you know, we didn't have customers, we didn't have anything. Um, and so what did we do to kind of start, start that journey? Uh, so we're going to kind of start from the attic and talk, you know, kind of the talk that sort of lives there. But uh, in a given year, I talked to thousands of small businesses and startups around the world. I spent about half my time going out and speaking to audiences and trying to give back uh, and empower them with lessons learned from that experience. But I'm also learning from working with them, plus having started some other things, you know, what are the lessons learned, you know, throughout. So, so that's sort of the premise of sort of the talk here. Um, so I'll just take a minute, um, uh, just a little bit about myself. So, so I have co-founded several things, Constant Contact being one of them uh, that most people know. How many are familiar with Constant Contact? Anyone using it? Thank you. Thanks. That's my aunt right there. And how many uh, are actually using it? All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, but so starting, starting businesses and startups, you know, and uh, small businesses, you know, it's in my DNA. So whether I'm doing it or I'm helping someone else do it. And I really work hard to try to get back and see what I could do to get the, the light to go off or see the eyes wide open when, you know, someone's working on, a, on an idea and I'm trying to sort of, sort of help them through that. Um, I'm also, you know, as I mentioned, uh, advisor, mentor, judge, speaker, national levels down to local, and just working with, again, uh, small businesses and startups to go uh, to bring that idea forward. Um, I am an angel investor, a limited partner in a venture fund. So I look at tech investments all the time, uh, mostly on the East Coast, and uh, making investments through a, I'm a limited partner in this fund that we're, we're now raising our, sec or raising our second fund and had some, have some, had some success over the last three years. Um, and then for fun, I'm a drummer. Um, so I'm supposed to tell you, Sunday night we'll be at Brew Brothers. I'll be jumping up with Toby Keith's house band uh, at Brew Brothers Sunday night. So if anyone wants to come out and, and, uh, and hear some and have some fun. Um, and I'm also a sailor, so I love to be on the water. And I haven't figured out how to get a, a drum set on a sailboat when it's keeled and be able to play to a song. So any engineers in the room? We could talk at the break, okay? I'm going to need help. That's a tough one. So, and then of course we all have that one person that we go to where we uh, share our ideas and we just want him to listen. You know, we don't necessarily always want advice. So this is my guy Bandit, and he listens to me about eight hours a day. So, and he just turns his head. I'm waiting for the advice moment, it's coming. All right, so let's dive in. So the first pillar is really around setting your guardrails. And this is, uh, this is really around kind of what's your core business. So how many sitting here really understand what's that one core thing they're gonna do in the business that if they nail it, it's gonna bring them all those things like getting customers, getting revenue, allow you to hire you know, others and so forth. So how many have that core, one core thing you've kind of nailed what that is? Okay, about 2%, 3%. That's okay, no wrong answers. It's really important to figure out that it, what that is because you know, we're also, when we start, we're wide-eyed to say, um, okay, who's our target market? So how defined are we in really knowing that target market? And then what are we going to do to help that target market? So what are we bringing to the market to assist them? And so if you could figure out that one thing, you know, it's going to bring a lot to you. But what happens is we, we get wide-eyed and say we're going to do all these things for, for a, you know, our target market. Um, and then you don't get that focus and you can't you know, accomplish all those things, especially in the early days. Make sense? And so, so in the case of Constant Contact, when we started, if we actually had a, um, a bicycle wheel, every single spoke on the wheel was another idea of what we were going to do to help small business. So we had, you know, the grand plan. We we're going to do it all. And we got some great advice, you know, some from, from early mentors and folks in the industry that, you know, said, you got to, you know, figure out, you got to focus. What's that one thing? And so for us, it was email marketing. Was that, was that first thing we were going to do to help small businesses? And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as we get, get into the talk. But you might, you know, as a, sort of the guardrails of a, lanes on a highway, you're going to pick a lane, you're going to stay in that lane, you're going to kind of execute on it. You might widen the lane and find how you broaden who your target market might be, offering, you know, pretty much the same offering to, to another audience with maybe minor tweaks. Um, you might add new lanes to that highway, which will be new things that, you know, are, are sort of separate from the core. So maybe adjacent, but maybe different. 
But that has to come in time when you have resources and money and can devote time to testing new things. So um, while you're on this journey, you might get off the highway, you might switch lanes, you might switch highways. You know, a lot of things are gonna happen as you're learning from you know, this target market uh, that you're working with and what resonates and, and what works uh, for them to decide what, um, you know, what you'll, you'll sort of be uh, going to market with or tweaking to go, go to market with in the future. If you don't figure out the core, and I'll tell you I meet hundreds a year of startups where there's somebody you know, who's so passionate about what they're doing and they're gonna solve all those world's problems and they will not get off that. And if you don't, this is your highway, okay? So you wanna avoid that, because you're not gonna get very far. Make sense? All right. So the next one is sort of testing and investing. So now we know our target market. We know the core thing that we're gonna to bring to market. And now we're gonna get out and test it. And there's a lot of things you can do to test your, your sort of your messaging, um, you know, how you're actually gonna to go to market, you know, where they're gonna find you and, and how are they gonna interact with you. What's the messaging going to deliver to them? There's a lot of things that come into play. Those are just some examples. But the key thing is figuring out, uh, for example, you know, everyone puts up a, builds their website. You work so hard to get it launched, and you're like, okay, deep breath, we're done. The bottom line is the minute you launch it, you just got, got started. Because you're going to have to figure out, is, is it resonating with people? And, you, you know, there are a lot of tools that will tell you, you know, how many are coming to the site and leaving right away. You know, within two seconds, how many leave? You know, and if you have a higher than normal abandonment rate, then maybe it's not resonating with them when they get there. Or where they came from, you know, they might have searched on Google for a certain keyword and they got there and it was something completely different. So it has you thinking about, well, maybe we should test different messaging and see what resonates. And that's everything from, you know, your elevator pitch. When someone says, oh, so what do you do? You know, you'll, you'll give me a kind of that, you know, minute, 30 second to a minute kind of overview of what you're doing. Um, but that, you may switch that, and it may switch by audience. So if you're talking to, you know, someone who's a potential customer, maybe a potential partner, maybe a potential investor, like that, that is going to switch just a little bit. Um, and so that's, those are some of the things you have to test to see what will resonate. Because the message you might deliver to a customer may not work well for a partner or a possible investor or maybe even an employee. Like, you know, thinking about kind of who you're, you know, sort of speaking with. I um, mean, as you test these things, you'll see what works and actually what, what resonated better than maybe the messaging you had before based on performance. You know, and are we getting more people kind of into the funnel and staying, you know, staying, spending more time with us, potentially converting better uh, and into being customers? So, so it's really thinking about uh, what are those, you know, what are those different things uh, that you can do sort of testing and then uh, adjust. And messaging is just one example, you know, website, um, you know, any of your copy, uh, you know, it's really key to sort of uh, nail all those things and then figure out, you know, what will increase your conversions. Make sense? So the next one is around kind of being metric driven. So, so all the things we do online, you can easily put hooks in to capture, uh, you know, what, well, what's happening, right? So, you know, you can put in hooks to, you know, for your website to see, you know, who's coming and how long are they staying and what pages are they going, starting from, what are they going to and where are they leaving and, um, you know, all of the, those things. Any of the digital advertising and marketing that you're doing, you can, you can be tracking kind of all those results. So these online things are all available. And I would just suggest, make sure you put the hooks in. You may not look at the data right away, like small business, I got a million things on my mind and I got so much going, like what would I do that data anyway? You're gonna have some basic number, you know, two, three, four, five metrics you're gonna look at that will give you a feel for what success would look like, okay? And so you wanna think about, um, you know, putting those hooks in because one day you're gonna wake up and say, you know what, we should measure that. Let's look at what the results of that looks like. And you're like, well, we don't have the data. Now you gotta wait nine months to a year before you get enough data to look at it. So, so think about getting the hooks in there, again, whether you look at it or not. A lot of free tools and, and some inexpensive ones to, uh, to put in place on those, uh, all the online stuff you're doing. I think as small businesses, the one thing we forget about is the offline, right? The offline stuff and measuring the time and or cost it takes to maybe acquire a new customer or to engage with someone. So imagine if I owned a gallery 
And uh, Jennifer came into the gallery to look at art, you know, spent an hour the first visit, came back a second time, spent a second hour, maybe called, you know, the gallery to ask some questions about an artist or two. And then, you know, half hour on the phone, comes in the, the third time for another hour. So we spent about three and a half hours with Jennifer coming into the gallery, and then she buys a $1,000 painting. So if our time was worth $100 an hour, we're gonna do some quick math, it's early. So we spent $350, right, to acquire that customer with three visits plus the half hour on the phone at $100 an hour. Uh, and so sold it for 1,000, so we made 650, right? So we can start to look at some of those metrics. And then Jennifer puts it up on her wall, she has a bunch of friends over, a friend sees it and likes it, goes into the gallery, you know, shorter cycle within an hour maybe, buying that art, so, so now we're up to 450 cost and 2,000, you know, that, that, was, that, that, that was purchased. So we're at 1550 profit over, we're, we're gonna get all confused on this math in a moment. So 450 and 1550, so you can test this math if anyone has a calculator. And so, so it's really important to think about that. It's, not, it's one thing to say, what's my time worth? But what's my investment to get that customer? But also anyone that works with you, right? So if I, the, if I was the gallery owner, and I had some staff that was, um, you know, kind of covering for me when I'm, I'm not there. If they saw Jennifer coming in that third time, second time even, maybe the third time, you know, they're on their phones and they're, they're disengaged and they're like, oh, tire kicker. You know, she's, she's been here a couple times. But if they actually knew that it's that third visit plus that call, you know, that three and a half hours investment is what drove the sale on average, then it's like, oh, we got to step up our game, third visit in you know, now's the time when they're, you know, getting ready to buy. So think about the offline things you do all day long and the time you're spending on them. And you'll see how much it's gonna take you to maybe acquire a new customer, how long it takes to service an existing customer, how long it takes to service a high, very needy, you know, a needy customer. And sometimes we're gonna find situations where we have to fire a customer because the, the, the sink in time isn't worth sort of the value of what they're bringing. And you have to think value not only what they're providing in terms of uh, their, you know, what they're spending with you, but their referrals and other things they're driving for you. And it's important to know in your business how much is being driven by um, you know, the person buying direct from you and you know, you know, kind of reordering and, and upselling and doing that, but what else are they bringing to the table with referrals? So they may be really needy and expensive individually, but they're just driving a ton of people to you. So you just have to think about like, what, you know, sort of what their value is overall, okay? So the next one is, uh, is around go to market. So in the case of Constant Contact, you know, we, um, you know, we were gonna sell to small businesses um, and the target market was really very small business. Walk down Main Street, you know, Reno here and all, the, all those businesses would be our, the target customer. Um, you know, 10 employees or less, in some cases one employee. And so, um, you know, we heard early on from a lot of people, hey, there's no way, there's no way, well, we heard a lot of things. There's no way, you know, a small business is gonna use email marketing and, you know, in the email for marketing purposes. There's no way you can sell to small businesses. You know, the only ones that were successful at doing that were companies like Intuit, and ADP, and you're three people in an attic, like, this isn't gonna happen. You know, you can't do it. A lot of no's. Um, and so, you know, initially we thought about, if we can't go door to door, so it was me, myself, and I with a team of three going door to door, we can, we can get somewhere, but we're not gonna get real far, and it's not gonna scale. You know, where, where can we scale this? And so, it really centered around finding the channel and partnerships and other things in our business to succeed. Um, and so, you know, you know, kind of your target customer being, you know, that, you know that's you know, sort of small business. You kind of know the market landscape of who they are and what verticals they're in and, you know, sort of how you're slicing, you know, which ones you're going after. You know, you have your strategy for, you know, what you're gonna offer them and how you're gonna offer it, how they're gonna get access to you. And of course, then comes into play a possible channel structure, which is where are those customers hanging out? So everyone in the room, I'll, I will tell you, uh, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of this on the second half of the, the talk, um, but, but understanding that for all of you, there are probably 10 to 15 categories of uh, small, small business uh, organizations that you could team with, right? And we'll go through some examples later, but um, so there's 10 to 15 categories, and within each category, there's gonna be you know, 10 to 15 key partners in the category 
that you could work with. So I'll give you one example. So associations and member orgs. Whatever it is you're offering, selling, there's the association of whatever you do, local, regional, national, uh, member orgs centered around that, meetups and networking groups. You know, those are just kind of under one uber category of those association and member orgs. But you have access to all of those, which will get you to your target market. And so it's as simple as going and hanging out and you know, work in the room. It's also the potential to you know, get up on stage and do the quick little you know, elevator pitch of what you do, and sometimes even doing more, where maybe you get to felt leadership and, and some other things where you're educating them on how to succeed using tools or services like yourself. So that's just one category out of the 15, or, you know, sort of 15 on average. So I challenge everyone to sort of th start to think about where are your target customers hanging out and what are those potential partner categories that you could sort of uh, work with. So uh, when we started Constant Contact, you know, we, what we, we, you know, we were really, everything was like make decisions in a minute. Like if we couldn't make the decision in a minute, we had to move on. Like we just don't want to take a lot of time iterating on things because we had to get, for example, get our offering stable enough to get it in the hands of small businesses to get feedback. Like a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's not ready. Like we need more time. Like if we just do this, these five more things, then we could bring it to, the, to our target customer. You gotta stop that. You gotta get it out and you gotta get feedback. And I would say when you do that, you don't wanna go to um, you know, friends and family. Uh, you don't wanna go to customers that you've bought from or you know well. You wanna go to total strangers. Because if you can do your elevator pitch, convince them to take your offering and potentially spend money with you, then you're onto something. And they're gonna give you brutal, honest feedback. So I went out to get four. Yeah, I just, you know, I started with, you know, didn't have the number in my mind. But yeah, I landed four total stranger uh, small businesses that took the early offering who, you know, had to go for the ride with us. And, you know, it had bugs and it, you know, something wasn't working. But as they started to use it, we saw the initial uh, sort of wide-eyed uh, experience that they had for their goal. What, what were their goals? So their goals were things like, I want to stay top of mind with my current customers. I want to drive those customers back in. I want, I want more revenue. I want uh, the uh, friends of those cust you know, customers. I need new, new people coming in. Maybe they'll refer people. So we started to see those things happen with, you know, with the offering. And so you know, when we saw how, how we were able to help them with their goals, that's when we knew we were onto something. Regardless of what everyone said, that we were not going to be able to succeed. And no one's going to be able to do what we were doing. So we had those four, right? Then immediately, uh, we went out to find the channels to where our target customers were hanging out. And so um, I mentioned in the opening, we had 8,000 channel partners. They, they have 8,000. I left officially April. Um, but uh, so, so 8,000 channel partners or more today. Um, so finding where they, so they were hanging out. And so, um, <clears throat> so we started, I started calling out to the largest of partners. And here's another example where someone, you will know, say to somebody, who's that one person you want to you know, partner with or get your offering in front of? And they'll tell me who it is. I'm like, have you called them? Oh, no, 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 no. Not yet. We're not ready to call them. You know, again, situation where we've got to get you over that to, to call someone else first and then call them. But but you've got to get in front of them. And so we started that, and we had success in landing some, some large partners. And of course, the first thing they're going to ask is, do you have references? So I'm like, I'll give you three. So I gave him three references. And they're like, do you have any more? I'm like, I'll give you one more. And no one asked for a fifth. So a little inside secret here. And so, so the key thing is to, you know, you get, some, you get some early success. You use that as leverage to show whoever you're going to work with that if they could succeed, Look what you, you know, imagine what could all your customers, and in some cases, thousands or hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of small businesses that we're working with those different partners. Make sense? All right. So the next one is around uh, kind of wowing your customers or surprise and delight. What are the things that you're going to do to delight, you know, your customers? And so we're all customers sitting here. We had, all had some experience this morning going to get our coffees or you know, what at breakfast or whatever we're doing, you know, getting our gas or, you know, stopping in a store. We all have experiences. We have a certain expectation of what we, we look for. And so think about the situations where someone exceeded that, right? There's sort of a bar there that we expect. And if it's below the bar, 
what are, what are the things we're going to do? We're going to put it out on social, or we might give them a bad rating and review, or, or never, you know, never go there and maybe just tell, quietly tell people, oh yeah, don't go there. You know, they, uh, they, weren't, they didn't smile, or they didn't do whatever you expected. And so when we think about the situations where someone exceeded it, then you say, okay, well, what's going to happen? You're going to go back. You're going to tell others. You're going to put it on social. You're going to give them a high rating and review. And however it is that you want to express you know, your gratitude for that wow moment. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, there's a local restaurant where I'm, I'm from Boston. And uh, so we went into the restaurant, took some friends in. The general manager came over to the table. He knew my name because I had the reservation was under my name. He said, Alec, I'd like to welcome you to the restaurant. Who do we have here? So I introduced everyone at the table. And so, you know, we ordered, he made some suggestions and he kind of said, if you need anything, let me know. He leaves, our meal comes, he comes back over to check on that everything was to satisfaction. And, and so we leave the restaurant and five days later, I get a handwritten note, home, you know, sent to my home. Imagine that, someone wrote a note and sent it to me in the, you know, through the post office. Like, what are the odds of that happening today, right? So I get the handwritten note with a card with a cell phone number on it and said, Alec, I hope you, and he named everyone at the table, had a wonderful meal. It, uh, um, you ordered some great things, including, you know, and he named some of the stuff we ordered. Like, very personalized, and said, here's my cell phone. If you need anything going forward, feel free to call. So it's like, and that's Aquitaine Bistro in the South End in Boston, if you ever go there. So sending in hundreds of thousands of people in there from around the world. Uh, but it's just one of those wow moments where you're like, okay, unexpected, incredible. The second one is I was uh, invited to go out to uh, the old downtown in, in Vegas to speak uh, with an organization that was tied with Tony Shea, and I had, who's the founder of Zappos. So I had the opportunity to take a private tour of Zappos. And if anyone goes out to Vegas, and if you love to gamble, great. Take some time to go to the old downtown and take a tour at, at Zappos. It's an incredible experience to just see you know, how, what they do and how they do it as a machine to just, you know, uh, assume that everyone that they pick up is the only person you know that's important to them at that moment you know and have a great customer experience and so there's some you know there's a lot of things about what they do and how they do it but I took this tour and we got to the customer success area and there's all these people on the phone just non-stop talking to customers and people were raising their hand with a card and runners were grabbing the cards and putting them in boxes and and then this one woman raised her hand with two cards grabbing them both and so they were going to say, well, the tour is going to continue. Can we move on? I said, well, I'll just stay here for a little while. And can I just understand, like, what's the deal with the cards? And, and so, you know, they expect that everyone on the phone, within a minute, makes a connection with the person they're talking to. So whether, whatever they're ordering, um, you know, something about what they're ordering to, you know, something about, you know, the, uh, what's the experience that they're ordering the items for. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that, uh, that they try to connect with. And in this one particular instance, I, you know, I said, well, what was the two cards? So we went over to the woman that took the call, and so she explained. A woman had called in, and she had a wedding in five days for her best friend. She had ordered shoes from someone else, was supposed to match the dress, didn't match the dress, which I think is a big deal. I don't know. Anyone? Yeah. And so, um, like, panic set in. So she called Zappos to try to get a replacement pair of shoes to match the dress. They found the exact shoe. But while she was speaking to the woman on the phone, um, you know, uh, she, she was hoarse and coughing and she was, you know, she was just really struggling with a, you know, a, uh, you know, a cold and a throat, throat issue and whatever. So the one card was a, a note to write to her, you know, so glad we could accommodate getting the shoes, you're gonna look great, you know, and have, have fun at you know, Betty's wedding. And then the other card was a note for a runner to go to the store and get lozenges and honey you know, and all kinds of stuff to help her, you know, with a note saying, you know, hope this will, you know, get you so you can be, uh, you know, cheering on your friend at her wedding and be able to talk and, and so forth. So, so it made an incredible connection and, of course, just creating a wow moment, right? So now when you call, don't, don't pretend you have a cough and, you know, just to get some free lozenges. They'll be on to you because uh, I've sent hundreds of thousands of people their way. So, uh, but the, the thing is it's just thinking about what can you do to set yourself apart and it doesn't take a lot, and it doesn't, usually doesn't take money. It's just something in the experience from as simple as just telling a, a you know, customer how much you care or treating them special, right? So this is not Bill Clinton, 
Um, he didn't get a, this wasn't a, a pre-job before presidency, uh, but this is the uh, publisher's clearinghouse. So I thought this, this had gone away, but as I go around the country, I, I see commercials and, you know, fill out your forms and, and win all kinds of money. And here's Glenda back in the day getting the oversized check for 10K with the prize patrol and flowers and, you know, cameras and, you know, the van full of people cheering. And, and so, you know, if this happened today, you know, Glenda would be immediately on social, you know, promoting how, look, I just won and you got to do this. It was so easy. And, you know, of course, back in the day, it was all, uh, you know, offline. Um, but just uh, creating a wow moment. So getting someone to do something, create it, and then capturing that and sharing it. And so they, uh, Glenda would share it, but also Publishers Clearinghouse would show how they've, you know, just changed the life of, of a family in the, you know, middle America, right? So just a good example. And so I haven't made these shirts yet, but I want a commitment from all of you. When I put them up on Amazon, you're all going to buy them and you're going to wear them and live by the mantra, right? Keep calm and delight the customer. So the next pillar is really around humanizing your, your voice, you know, from the business perspective. The nice thing is, as we're all small businesses, we have the flexibility to put personality in our business. You know, if you're a big, big competitor, you would have all kinds of things that you'd have to, you know, triple check the, you know, every word you wrote, the lawyers got involved, you know, it wasn't just a marketing team writing copy. You, you had to really sort of follow some rules or guidelines around, you know, what, what you say. As a small business, you have a lot more flexibility. You can have a personality and you could, you could put your voice forward. And it could be your voice, it could be you know, fellow employees, it could be customers, if it's a nonprofit, uh, recipient of services or volunteers. So there's an opportunity to kind of have a personality around that. When we started Constant Contact, the fourth person in, in the attic that joined was a dear friend who I've recently teamed up on another project with. Um, and so uh, we trademarked her title was Email Marketing Diva. So we had a trademark title and she was, she was uh, writing our hints and tips and our newsletters and, and all the sort of things that were customer facing and started to put a personality about you know, our company and, and, and what we were all about you know, in those writings. And, and we had some fun with it and, and so forth. And so she did that for over 10 years and, and it just sort of set the stage in the early days for you know, kind of what's our culture and and what do we, how do we want to be known and, and how do we want people to remember us and the experience we want them to have and thinking about the things that you're doing. And it's easy to, to you know, really humanize it so that your customers get to know you as a business. And it's not this behind the veil you know, or the wall you know, of, um, you know, of, uh, of the business, but you're out there and they get to know you. And you can have some fun with it. You know, a lot of people will do things on Facebook and other tools with open-ended questions or you know, uh, do you like A or B and, you know, start to engage the audience uh, to, uh, to get feedback and things like that. So that's me on the left. Um, so uh, this is really around perception. You know, look big, act big, become big. So when we were three people in the attic, you know, we had to do anything we could do to look bigger than life. When no one ever came to the attic, it was a mess. Uh, occasionally, we used my dining table in Boston for, uh, for meetings, but what we, we sought out to get was, you know, friends were all working for high-powered law firms and accounting firms and, you know, mahogany, you know, beautiful conference room overlooking Boston Harbor, and we'd beg and borrow to, like, get a conference room for an hour, and, you know, someone would, would want to meet with us, and we're like, oh, we're going to happen to be downtown, why don't you visit, uh, you know, this you know, one international place, and we'll be on the top floor, you know, penthouse. You know, we have a conference room, you know, for, for other things, so why don't we meet there? And so, again, it's just perception, like, wow, like, and of course, then the friend that would invite us in, we had to be situated so they could see us, so they could tell us, like, you know, get out, <laughs> you know. Someone has a meeting, you're done. Um, but, you know, you got to work with what you had, right? So you kept your meetings to, uh, you know, to very prompt time. Um, but there are other things. So, you know, we're often calling out to people. You know, we're, we're in uh, today's day and age, especially the millennials, everything is short snippets of content, 147 character. But when you're out and you're talking to folks, uh, like partners, for example, today they don't want to necessarily always see you, unless it's local, you know, we'll meet face to face. But I've closed the largest partnerships in the world and never met the people, because they want to sort of do it, you know, on the phone and remote, you know, video conferencing, whatever it is, 
Uh, oftentimes, they're sitting there saying, well, if they fly in, we got to host them for dinner, we got to take them to breakfast, we got to take pick them up at the airport, like we got to invest all this time, just want to have a two-hour meeting, kind of you know, see if there's a meeting of the minds. So if you do those sessions over the phone, the first thing is um, you know, professionalize what you're doing. So it might be your first call to a partner, just like we did. You, know, you put a small PowerPoint together with your brand and have um, you know, things like, uh, this, is, uh, this is who we are, this is what we do, here's how we help our target customer, um, here's what our target customer is saying, you know, here's how we could you know, potentially work with you as a partner. So you, so you sort of just come up with four or five, six slides, you know, professionalize it. And then when you get on the phone, say, look, I you know, put a little slide deck together. Can we maybe start there just you know, to give you a little bit about you know, who we are and what we do? They always say yes, so you deliver that. So in professionalizing what you're saying, of course, then you finish the call, you send them a PDF of it, and then they're going to revisit it before they may talk to other team members or share it with other team members. And so the key thing here is to, um, you're, you're avoiding the telephone game. Like, you told them something on the phone, they interpreted it a certain way, then they reinterpret and, send, you know, and give it to someone else, and it may not even be close to the original message. And then what happens is then they're like, oh, we don't need that. That doesn't really make that much sense. Or the per it could have just been the person telling the story. It just didn't do you justice. And so then you, the next thing is they'll say, oh, let's have a team call. So on the second call, you'll say, look, you know, we have this PowerPoint. I'm sure you probably shared it. Some of you saw it. Maybe we could just kind of go over it and level the, the level set for everyone, you know, what we're, what we're offering. Do you mind if we go through that first? They always say yes. And then you're driving the conversation again. But you're putting your best foot forward to look really professional. Okay? The other thing around perception is that, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I talk to a lot of people, like, who's that one person you want to get on the phone and talk to? And they'll always hesitate. Not yet. Well, I'm going to call them in a week, you know, and they put it, you know, put a little box that the, you know, call this partner in a week, and then it just drops, the, you know, eventually they throw that page out, put another one, oh, I'm going to call that part partner again, let me call them in a week. You know, they just, you just avoid, you're, you're avoiding it. And so, the thing I would just say is, you know, you, you can hear through the phone if you're hesitant, right? And so you want to, want to make that call when you're at your best. So call a loved one, you know, hug a baby, you know, you know, kiss a loved one, call your best friend, sing your favorite song out loud, and then get on the phone and call them. Like, whatever it's going to take you to get you fired up, to be, like, on your game to make the call, because they'll hear it right through the phone. And the minute you have anything in your business that you did that was a, you know, something to celebrate or you're really happy about, make a call. Like, just don't sit there like, let me put my feet up, you know, and kind of, let's bask in the moment. That's your opportunity to do another one, right? Because you're now on a roll. So I always say, like, accomplish, accomplishments are something to build on, not rest on. So the minute you have one of those success moments, capitalize on it, because it will lead to something else, bigger and better, okay? Um, and so the other thing I'd say, you know, just hesitance in general, you know, even when you're out, like, if you're not, like, if you're not really comfortable about we're just getting going and we're kind of figuring, finding our way for what our elevator pitch is and, and how we're going to present it. Whatever you say, say it with confidence, right? Don't hesitate because everyone will hear it and they're going to question, are you really serious about the business or you don't even really know what you're doing? Like, just say it with confidence. It may not be exactly right or you might have messed it up or, you know, whatever. Just, uh, just be confident in whatever you're doing, okay? Because it will come back in spades, you know, with opportunity. All right, so everyone raise your right hand. All right, uh, immediately and effective immediately are now dubbed thought leaders. Okay, Congra congratulate yourself. It's amazing you accomplished that so fast. Um, so, so the reason I say that is that you're, you're all here for a reason. You're, you're uh, in business to disrupt something that already exists or you have a cool new thing that doesn't exist today. You're doing something different. And it could be just around execution or what, it doesn't matter. You're, gonna, you're setting out to do something better, bigger, better, faster, different, whatever that is. And if you could think of ways to package that up with best practices or, or thought leadership and, and what makes you unique and what makes you different with regard to how you're doing those things, 
Um, you know, that's the, that's the thing that people will gravitate to. So it's one thing to have an offering and just say, I want to promote it. Let's promote it. Oh, yeah, we'll promote, promote it over here. We'll promote it there. We'll, we'll just get all these people, you know, just promoting it. Well, eventually they, they'll go numb to promotional related things. And it's more about how are you packaging up your messaging um, in a way that will resonate with them uh, so, so that they'll say, okay, hey, if I use this or I do this or I work with them, it's going to take my business to the next level. So you just need to think about how you're sort of packaging it around best practices and thought leadership. Um, the other thing is it's gonna get you to audiences that you wouldn't have gotten to before because um, there are many organizations that you know, will say, we don't want anything promotional. You know, I've had, if, I, if I had a dollar for every time I heard, no vendors are allowed to speak, but you, we want you to speak because you're gonna empower our audience with your thought leadership and best practices. And we set out to do that as a, as a business and in fact, at the, the peak, we were doing 7,000 thought leadership workshops around the, around the world um, in, you know, in a year. And we hit our, you know, about a year ago or so, we hit our millionth person that we educated for free on thought leadership. And so there are a lot of people that are out there that are hungry to learn, how am I gonna benefit from this? Like, what's this gonna do for my business? And so that's your subtle commercial for, okay, you saw what we can do for you, and you know, if you want help in doing that, hey, we can, you know, we have the tools and services to help you with it. So it's really taking a different tact for positioning your messaging and what you're bringing to the table, you know, to uh, and to how you can you know, sort of pull people into the fold. You know, there's some people that just need to hear what's in it for me before they're going to want to hear a commercial about what you're offering them. And so, so just think about how you can package up what you're doing. Um, and I'll also say there are a lot of publications and a lot of, um, a lot of folks you'll engage with that will want to talk about your business, but don't want promotion, they don't want anything promotional. Like, they, you know, they go numb to, like, signed our 100th customer and our 50th partner and our this and our that. It sort of doesn't, doesn't really excite a lot of people. But if you could talk about the thought leadership, they'll take that and want to tell it to their audience. And earlier I mentioned the, the, um, the uh, association of member orgs. They are really hungry for, for that thought leadership and the stuff to their audience because they're looking for value add. Everyone that's part of that organization paid a member fee. And they're always looking for things like, what can we offer our members that will help them succeed? And hey, if we brought it to the table, they'll see more value in, in their membership and want to stay, stay part of the organization. So you could fall into that category. And in some cases, uh, when, um, in working with folks like that, they're, they're not always looking for, uh, they're, they're fine to just take the, you're, you know, if you're on the editorial uh, side versus advertising, like member, membership and editor, or editorial versus, mem, you, know, the, um, you know, just trying to get you to join as a member, you know, you, you'll find that sometimes they just wanted you to come in through sharing your thought leadership and helping their audience before, you know, asking you to become a member, okay? So the next one's around uh, feedback. So feedback's a gift. You know, there's so many different ways we can get feedback. There's online ways, formally, you know, surveying people and, you know, capturing information from, you know, sort of online. There's offline ways, simply asking, you know, how did we do or how was your experience or, or whatever it may be. Um, there are some that are fo you know, formal and informal. So survey online would be formal. You know, asking someone, you know, face to face could be it would be considered, you know, informal, um, and so you want to try to put a, put that in play wherever possible. Um, how many have heard of the Net Promoter Score? Okay, about twenty percent. Just Google Net Promoter Score, and you'll see that there's a there's a specific question you can ask folks, which is, how likely are you to refer us to someone else? So that takes someone from, I'm a user and I'm a customer, to I, li I really like they're doing and I feel comfortable telling someone else. And then they give you a way to calculate um, how, to, how to figure out your net promoter score. So I would just say when you look it up, don't worry about anyone else's score. FedEx at 35 and you know, this one at this, and it doesn't matter because you're going to come up with your own score and you're going to test that over time to see is your net promoter score for you and the things you're doing, how you're helping your customers, is it going up? Is it you know, staying the same or going down? 
And oftentimes you'll find that this and customer satisfaction in general, you've done something with your offering, you've increased your pricing, you put something out that didn't work as well as it was working before, or you, you, you launched something and you didn't really give them, you didn't inform ahead of time so they knew what changes were coming and now all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, this does not look like anything I've seen, you know, I was using before. You know, you don't want to be startling them with anything. And so, so you want to uh, um, think about, you know, those things as it relates to, you know, normal course of business, but, but you'll be capturing your customer satisfaction and your net promoter score um, and just seeing kind of, are they on a happy path? You know, all my customers are the majority of them on a happy path moving along. You know, the, I would say the one group a lot of people forget about are your current customers. Like, oh, well, we, they're in, they're, we have them. They're already in-house, like, let's go get new ones. So we spend all this time going to get net new without really thinking about you know, our existing customers. And oftentimes when we start to think about them, it's too late. Because we've either lost them, or they're fading out, or they just felt they weren't you know, out of sight, out of mind. Like, haven't heard from that company in a while. Um, and so you just need to think about you know, how you're, you're gonna engage with them. But just keep asking the questions. Um, and certainly weave in that one question about the net promoter score which will be really helpful because feedback is such a gift, good or bad. You know, um, you know some, someone at a talk last week was like, well, what do you do when someone goes on social and, and you know, really complains about you? So the first thing is you walk away from the computer, you know, take a, lap, a couple of laps around the house or whatever you have to do, go for a jog, but walk away from the keyboard. Um, because what will happen is that you're, you're you know, you'll, um, you know, some other people, you know, potential will step in and uh, speak on your behalf. We'll talk about those people in a moment. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the key thing is that's a, that's, a, that's a moment where you can shine. Like, hey, we didn't do the best that we normally do. That's not our normal experience. Let's go offline and we're going to make it up to you or we're, you know, we're going to kind of work through this and, and make sure we, uh, we take care of you. You know, everyone else seeing that would be like, okay, this is a good company. They care about folks, and you know we all know not every experience is going to be a great one, and it's what do you do with it, you know, when it happens, and so that's where you can step up as a business. I've seen so many where they're like, I'm going to challenge this person. You know, they came in, they took forever to order, they like, you know, you got a, the owner saying like, you know, whatever, and then you know I can point to those same businesses that are no longer in business, and you know it's because if you you have to, you know, customer does come first to to a certain point. And you, you need to figure out how you're going to sort of service them, especially in that time when you've let them down. And you can shine when you do it, okay? So I was just talking about, um, you know, what happens when you step away. It's kind of the cradle to rave strategy. So, so initially, we treat everyone equally. Whatever level they're at, however long they've been with, whatever they've spent with us, uh, whatever they didn't spend but they're hanging out and just getting to know us, you know, you're going to sort of work them through a continuum where they're just, you know, sort of a, pros a suspect turns into a prospect, turns into a customer, a long-standing re repeat customer, and then a raving fan. Like, those are just some examples. But they're going to work through this continuum, and you might treat people differently, like your raving fans or your VIP customers that, that re you know, repurchase and, and buy from you, you know, reorder and do, do different things, or tell others and connect you to other people. And, but so, you, so, so initially, we treat them all equally, but think about how you might start to segment them but it's this raving fan group that if you walked away from that keyboard, they're gonna step in on your behalf and comment like, hey, I've been doing business with them for years. They're a rock star and you know, that's not the norm. And they'll take care of you, believe me. You know, um, you're, you know, you'll have a great experience with them or whatever they're gonna say. So you can walk away and you're gonna start to see some of that happen. And that's more valuable than anything. And then you get a chance to step in and make it right. Uh, but at least you know that you're, you have you have wowed somebody and taken care of them to a point where they're a raving fan and they want to tell, tell folks. And um, So I, I'd like to tell you and admit in public that I am a connector and I, I'm here to admit it. So if I have a good experience with something, I always seem to find a way to weave it into a conversation and tell someone else about it. And it's so random, like had a plumber to the house, I had this incredible experience. Two plumbers you know, couldn't fix something and this guy he took all this extra time, fixed it, you know, didn't even really charge me for all this time. I'm like, I'll pay you for your time, and this is a rock star. He said, no, 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 you know, it, just, it was good for me to you know, work with you to figure it out. And of course, like two days later, I'm at a networking event, someone's talking about a plumber, I'm like, I got the guy for you. 
Like it just happens within like four or five days. I'm connecting whoever I just had that experience with with someone else. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of folks are out there like me that are, and will admit that they're connectors to, to just talk about those experiences. And uh, you know, I want to reward the people that took care of me. Um, so think about you know, what you can do to move people through this life cycle to being raving fans. All right? So uh, Letterman retired, David Letterman. So that was 10 if you were counting. Um, so he's gone and I have two more because these were, uh, they were on the cusp of, didn't want to didn't cut something else out, so we'll give you a couple more quick ones. Um, so the first one is around just celebrating uh, all wins, small and large. You know, we're all sitting here, you know, with like the, the big goal that we're after, which could be a year from now, five years, whatever it is. Like I'm gonna just, you know, work myself to retirement in five years. Like you could have a, that goal and, and sort of the vision of where you wanna be with this. Which is, which is great, everyone should have that. But the thing you want to think about is um, what are you celebrating today or several times in a day? Those little teeny things that, that show success. So when we started the company you know, early on, uh, it was in the fall, football season. So we had a foam core football field with Velcro. So we had the Velcro on the football and we started on the four yard line. So 100 yards on the field we had four was representing four customers. Then we got our fifth one, we moved it to five, and we went all the way down. We were ringing the bell every time and celebrated across the company for everyone who was involved in getting that customer. So if you're answering the phones or you're, you're the, the admin at the front desk or you're, uh, you're an engineer or you're whatever, marketing, you messaging, you know, what everyone was doing, like we were all celebrating. So we moved it down to 100, and then we started back again, and every yard was 10. So we went down you know, in tens. And then everyone was 100, and then we got to 1,000, and then we had to move to dashboards uh, because it was too, too tough to keep manually. Um, so we had around the company, you know, we had dashboards everywhere showing what each group was doing to delight our customers. What are the things that they were focused on that was going to help our customers? And we found it in every group. You know, so whether it was call handling, you know, people calling in for support, needing help. We didn't care how long the call was. What was the success and completion of the call? So we they would do a survey after the call, and if the ratings, you know, 90 plus percent, you know, we would sort of be living at, uh, we would always, you know, um, track, you know, success to satisfying the customer, and then telling all those stories. And we had Wow Awards to employees that it's a Friday night, we're shutting down, support at 11 p.m. So it stayed till two in the morning because that small business needed to have something out before the morning event that they were hosting and they had some problems you know, creating a campaign or whatever it was. So there were always these examples of folks that went above and beyond. And we rec recognized them internally. So it's not just the wins of the business, but the wins of those in, that are working with you that go the extra mile. Um, and so we had it where you know, uh, employees can, can, um, can give them to each other. You know, it wasn't just you know, someone up atop looking down saying, oh, that person did a great job. Like, like let their peers and others call them out for that, that great effort so that everyone got recognized at every level. So the last one is have fun. So we, we took Halloween very seriously and uh, we had one category for costume that was best use of what we did by day. So I wanna show you my costume, you have to tell me what I am. Come on, we're, half, we're halfway there. Social Butterfly, there's a winner. Congratulations. Social Butterfly, and that, my friends, is an award-winning costume. Got the trophy, baby. <laughs> All right, thank you. I couldn't find the, uh, the headgear, otherwise I wore, would have wore it today. Um, so the other thing I said early on is I'm a drummer. Love to, love to get out and uh, play whenever, uh, whenever possible. Um, and so I actually went into the studio. I wrote a song about Constant Contact. Stole the, uh, you know, the, the, the beat from uh, Grand Funk Railroad. So they, haven't, they, 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 were, they were pleased with it. They don't know, but I'm sure they'll be pleased with it. Uh, and so, uh, so I wrote the song, grabbed some coworkers, went in the studio, recorded the song, then went down on Main Street and, and brought our customers into the video. 
And of course, what happened? They just were sharing it all over the place to, like, hey, we're, we made it into the Constant Contact song video. And I then did a second one and uh, performed it a couple years ago in Vegas for our partners and performed with a, uh, a, a Vegas band, a top Vegas band to, uh, to do the song for our partner, partner conference. And so, again, having fun and finding ways to, uh, you know, to just, you know, celebrate, you know, internally and externally what we're doing. All right? Don't be sorry. That's okay. All right, so the, the number one question I get all the time is, so what's next? Um, so, so I personally like to look at markets that are billion dollars or more that need disruption. So I'm just throwing that out there. So it's a tall order, but I'm very fortunate to be teaming with, uh, so we have a think tank um, of some of the, the brightest, most incredible engineers. So my two co-founders are ro just rock star engineers and uh, have patents on all different products, have look, can look at something and say, yeah, yeah, I know how to make that better. And then we set out to do that. And so we've had some success in doing that. Um, two of us involved for the last eight years, all three of us the last three years. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples of stuff we're working on, all right? So the first one is, uh, so this is called a linear actuator or a ball screw. So the cylinder just rotates back and forth on the screw. Uh, it's used in things like cameras, drones, uh, planes, electric steering columns of cars, all kinds of uses, thousands and thousands of uses. There was one particular use where there was a forensic optic camera that was on a computer manned 4x4 vehicle that was policing two kilometers of the roadways in Afghanistan and other locations to to uh, heat seek and try to find someone who's coming to the road to drop a roadside bomb. Um, so the one thing that was failing in this, and by the way, let me just back up. So the, the vehicle will actually could throw a grenade within a three foot radius, could shoot a gun, speak in local language, could see through walls. Um, you know, it's just incredible, incredible machinery uh, that the government and General Dynamics had built. And so the camera couldn't focus because cameras, the ball screws that were in the market um, actually, it's called uh, backlash, but when it switches direction, it, it stops. So if you have a fancy camera, it stops for a second before it switches direction. And it needed something to be fluid, so it was just fluidly moving back and forth. And so um, we, uh, they came and gave the spec to my co-founder. He said, give me six weeks, I'll figure something out. We have machined equipment, so we m machined the prototype, and uh, he sent that back. Um, and this has actually stopped roadside bombs. So, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we're in a bunch of tests and in in pilots and with all different uh, industries and uses. So the second one is, uh, think about the Reese's peanut butter cup. You have chocolate and peanut butter, you put them together. Think of a walking cane and a uh, reaching grasper grabber you know, that folks use. Whether you're aged, uh, injured from, you know, or, or recovering from injury or from a surgery, or if you're disabled, you know, there's need for either the cane or the reaching grasper or both. In my mom's case, she had knee surgery, was using the cane, and had a grasper in each room. But none of them were really that effective and, and uh, good quality. So we set out to create the best cane and the best grasper in the market, throw them together, which is the, the handycane.com. Brought it to market about eight months ago, have won awards for innovative product of the year and best provider's choice award, you know, a couple of different conferences and have had success in, um, in, in solving the problem of, you know, it's fine if you're in your house and you have a cane and a grasper, but what do you do when you leave the house? You know, so, so you can have your freedom and independence back. You can have your mobility. You don't, you're not gonna be compromised when you drop your keys or you go to a supermarket and you try to get a can off a shelf or whatever it may be. Uh, so it's precise to pick up a piece of paper, a paper clip, a, a coin, all the way up to, you know, jar, can, bottle, um, with what kind of the, five plus pounds, around five pounds of weight that you can support yourself. Um, so that's the second product that we've, uh, that we've launched. And the third one, <clears throat> we've done a feasibility study we haven't launched yet, uh, but we're working on an arthrectomy device that will, through a catheter and a guide wire, will go into, uh, into the vessels to take out, uh, you know, sort of um, break up and emulsify, emulsify the plaque and actually extrude it while letting blood flow still go so there's no sort of pause in the blood flow, which would be a replacement to stents. Right. 
So that's underway in uh, feasibility study, looking good so far. So those are just three, three other things. Uh, there's some others, but those are some big ones. Yeah, so disrupting big markets. Um, so um, I, we're going to save the Q&A for, uh, we're going to have a sort of follow-on uh, interactive talk after this, but if, um, if you want sort of a worksheet around the, uh, the pillars, all you have to do is pull out your phone and just type the 21777. And if you type the word pillars, it'll give you a link, give you your first name, last name, email, and you'll get to a page where you can download the worksheet. You can give me some feedback because it's a gift about the talk or things you, you know, uh, what resonated or other things you maybe wanted, would have wanted to hear. Um, and there's also links to the couple of music videos that I mentioned. So, so there you go. So uh, keeping on time, uh, I'd like to thank you. I know we're going to take a quick break, quick break, and then we're going to get into sort of a strategic deep dive of um, just, uh, just some of the things um, in, in sort of mission and vision and your target customer. And so we're going to kind of work with all of us, uh, you know, hands on, if you will. So, so I want to thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat>